right? Because you can imagine that there's a certain state of mind that you're in. Maybe it's a state of something approximating nihilistic hopelessness that grips you every time you're motivated to seek out your favorite drug. And that's fairly far back in the activation chain, but it's there every time you take a hit. So what happens is the dopaminergic reinforcement produced by the drug reinforces that nihilistic hopelessness that drives the drug-seeking behavior. That's right. And that's how, in part, you develop a monkey on your back. Yeah, I, I love the example, even though I, I, uh, I'm sad that it happens for people. I, I love the example because what you're saying is that, and it's exactly right, that the memory for events and states of mind and emotions that preceded a successful collection of reward or arrival at reward mm-hmm. is set into a huge number of motor commands, some of which are subconscious. And and and, right. and the the ultimate dopamine signal, actually I experienced this the other day. I can give an example. Um, my girlfriend and I decided to go to the beach. We were going to do this little ritual that we've been talking about doing for a while. And I had on a piece of paper what we had written out we were going to do. And I had it in my back pocket and we got to the ocean and the sun was setting sort of perfect timing for this. And the piece of paper was gone. And I thought, oh my goodness, how did I screw this up? Like of all the things, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to, you know, I, I've been, I'm 47 years old. This is not like I should be able to, to do this. You know, that Get your I blew it. Yeah, I blew yeah. it. So I, I went back to the car, long walk, looking everywhere. It was not a windy day, but I thought, gosh, where's this piece of paper? Looking around, didn't find it. Went all the way back to the car, was in the car, came all the way back. And I was walking toward her. I saw her and I thought, okay, this is really embarrassing. I'm going to just have to have to wing it or remember. We didn't have our phones intentionally either, so we couldn't look it up. And then I saw the piece of paper on the beach and it was partially buried in the sand. I picked it up and I was elated. What happened there was my mm-hmm. dopamine had dropped way below baseline because I was disappointed that I'd lost it, disappointed in myself, et cetera. And then I found right, it. And right. so your anticipation was for nothing. Exactly. So you got punished by yourself for that. Exactly. Because that should be eradicated. If you're highly anticipatory and it doesn't make itself manifest, then you were seriously wrong. So you're going to take a emotional hit as a consequence of that. I think that's also associated, that emotional hit, that pain that you feel, I think that's actually associated with the beginning stages of the death of the systems that mediated that initial response. Because you should eradicate systems that make you anticipate that don't work, right? And that means those systems, which are already instantiated and alive in some sense, have to decay and die. And it strikes me as highly probable that you're gonna pay a price in something approximating pain for the death of those malfunctioning systems. It's also why, because why wouldn't they fight for their lives to some degree? Why wouldn't they resist the decay and death that might be necessary to keep you going. Why There should be some pain associated with that logically because it is a biological transformation. Yeah, it's an interesting so, way to lens to view it through that that self uh, image that I had in that moment of, you know, I'm a, the responsible partner who can take care of a simple thing, right? For this nice little ritual that we'd been talking about doing for a while. I failed, right? So that part- Well, it's, it, well, it's also so interesting. You think about that. This is a depressive cascade, eh? That, and it's very hard to bind because imagine you anticipate something and then you make a mistake. Now, the question then becomes, how significant is the mistake? And one view of your error would be, well, the paper blew out of my pocket and that could happen to anybody. And the, the more catastrophic interpretation would be, and it's an extension of the thought path that you started to walk down. Well, I'm near 50 years old. I should be much more responsible than this, and there's something wrong with me as a person. And then a depressive person would go even further. They'd say, well, not only is there something wrong with me in this decision, this is a decision like every other decision I make right now. I never make a good decision. In the past, I've never made a good decision, and there's no way I'm going to change in the future. And so they, the depressive takes that um, punishment response, let's say, that's a consequence of failed anticipation, and can't bind it. It just, it just takes out all of their potential future selves. That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. And so then they're in a depressive pit. Yeah. It's a, so that's, that's too much learning from failure. Right. That's a, it's a, uh, I'm really, um, I'm grateful for, the, for your insight on this because indeed, if I'm, if I'm honest, the, my thought train went to the point of, um, you know, I didn't think, oh, I'm a total failure because I lost this piece of paper. I thought to myself, well, you know, if it were a priority, I would have ensured I wouldn't have lost it. Right, right. Uh, she'll right. interpret it as not being a priority. Like, where are my priorities? Am I, you know, am I overspent? You know, like, what, what's going on? You start to sift into the, the full set of questions. And then, of course, finding the paper right. 
resurrects the sense of self. It was, you know, I think it was yeah. in that movie, Pulp Fiction. Yeah, well, that, that binding problem is really tricky, eh? Because so there's some good rules of thumb for that, which is it, one of the rules of thumb for that that's extremely use, that useful, that's socially instantiated, is innocent until proven guilty. Right, so you might say when those thoughts come up, because they're adversarial and accusatory thoughts, you might say, well, that is part of the realm of possibility, but I shouldn't, when your child does something wrong that's minor, you don't say you're a rotten kid, right? You say, you bind it, you say, look, kid, here's a bunch of things you're doing right. But in this particular example, specific situation, here's the minimal thing you did incorrectly and how to alter it. And it's a really good habit of mind. It's like to, to, to address towards yourself as well as to other people, which is to say, well, what's, what's the minimum crime that I'm responsible for in this moment? And that's part of this miracle of the presumption of innocence, and especially without proof. And a lot of what I did in my clinical practice to people who had a depressive temperament was help them make a case for themselves. It's like, well, maybe you're as bad as you think you might be, but maybe not. Let's take the contrary argument. Let's make you as innocent as you can be in this situation and, and only narrow the repair to the absolute minimum that needs to be manifested. Now, some people don't have that problem because they don't have a depressive state of mind, let's say. They're somewhat resilient to the cascading effects of punishment. Those are people who are low in trait neuroticism, by the way. So you could think of trait neuroticism as an index to which the degree failure coactivates punishment across a whole sequence of nested selves. The more, the higher you are in neuroticism, the more likely a given error is to a cascade up the hierarchy of possible selves. And it's a, it's a trade-off because sometimes when you make one little mistake, it is actually an indicator of a flaw in your character. But most of the time it isn't. And it certainly can't be responded to that all the time because then you'd never be able to make a mistake without wiping yourself completely out. And that's obviously not helpful. Is it fair to say that, um, at least in the, the raising of children and maybe in the raising of ourselves, that we should, as much as possible, try and emphasize that errors are due to state, not trait? Um, you know, yes, absolutely. And you do that in an argument with your, with your, your wife as well. You, you want to make it as local and precise as you possibly can. So, and, and that's also one of the advantages to removing yourself from a rage or an anxiety state because a rage or an anxiety state is low resolution and global. And so it'll be globally accusatory. And, and so you want to specify it and you think, okay, well, what's the, what's the minimum necessary behavioral transformation to ensure that similar mistakes are not replicated in the future? And generally that doesn't require like read. It's like if your roof leaks, you don't have to dig a new foundation. You can just fix a few shingles. And you might think, well, the rain's coming through, so you have to tear down the whole house. It's like, well, no, you have to. And you might panic and run around because the water's coming in, but it's still a bad idea to dig up the foundations every time something trivial maintenance problem needs to emerge. And so one of the things you, that's very useful to learn is like, well, is this only a trivial maintenance problem? And one of the advantages to that too is that if it's not the collapse of your entire self, let's say, and it's a trivial maintenance problem, you're much more able to activate that, that courageous response to anomaly that's part and parcel of exploratory behavior and eventual success. So and part of the trick of, of, of many sorts of, of, well, I would say religious training enterprises, certainly the meditative enterprises, is something like, how do you tell yourself a story, like a real story, though a, a story that actually works, that's most likely to put yourself put yourself in a position where you can confidently approach the thing that's blocking your path. This, um, this notion, uh, you brought up three points that I, I, I think immediately of the, the related neurology, but I, I'm going to repeat them back to make sure I understand because they're, they're very salient in my mind right now, which is this notion of the prefrontal cortex uh, trying different versions of self and working with, uh, contending with bodily states in, that, in those moments. Mm -hmm. um, and the sort of either... Um, death or, or, uh, you know, you know, or, or growth or resurrection of those different selves, depending on the outcomes. Right. The, right. the next, I, I, this notion of state or trade, I find 
uh, fascinating. Uh, you know, after I found that piece of paper, I felt like I was like the greatest, you know, I got this huge dopamine surge because it's a, it's the Delta. It's the difference between your baseline and the peak. Yeah, right. So even though I'd lost it, right. I mean, I should have thought, oh gosh, I wasted 30 minutes of our time. But instead I thought I found, I found this amazing. And I felt so elated. I think there was a, it was the movie Pulp Fiction. I think it was the John Travolta character said something. I'm going to get this wrong, but you know, he said it was almost worth losing that just to find it again. He was talking about something. I forget right, what it was. Right, right. And I think that captured it there as well. 